Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to note that we'll have both live captioning uh, and uh, ASL translation available, and that a recording of today's session will be posted uh, later today. Uh, today, we'll be able to go up to two in the afternoon. Uh, our plan for the rest of the month because of the holiday is there will not be a briefing next Friday as it's the day after Thanksgiving when we hope everyone is uh, home and with family and enjoying a nice long weekend. Uh, we'll resume these briefings again the following Friday, December the 4th. Uh, today's agenda we'll hear as usual from Chief Health Officer Preeti Malani giving us an update on uh, campus conditions in the pandemic. We'll hear also from Provost Collins and Vice President Harmon about updates from academic affairs and student life. Uh, today, we're joined with several special visitors. Um, Associate Vice President for Human Resources, Rich Holcomb is here to discuss resources and engagement with the University of Michigan staff. And Jeannie McAlpine, uh, Director of Work-Life Programs is here to discuss options for dependent care. Uh, we're also joined by Kelsey Stratton, a program manager for Res resiliency and well-being services, and she'll discuss some resources available for staff uh, as well. Uh, before we get started on the program, I want to mention briefly uh, that the ongoing good news about uh, the uh, testing on COVID vaccines uh, has led the university to stand up a process to start getting ready for vaccination. Now, it's, it, it's not in the very near term future, but it'll certainly be in the months ahead. I've asked Executive Vice President uh, and Dean of the Medical School, Marshall Ruggie, uh, to lead that effort campus wide. And there's a committee up and running uh, already making plans for vaccine distribution. Uh, the distribution will be um, uh, determined uh, significantly by federal guidance, uh, is likely to go to frontline healthcare workers and others whose uh, workplaces require exposure to uh, COVID-19 infected persons, and then in a hierarchy thereafter, but we're starting our preparations to be ready. So I think that's optimistic news as we look to, to the year ahead. Uh, let's first begin with Dr. Preeti Milani. Thanks. So it's it's November 20th, and this is a, a, a moment that a lot of us have had marked on our calendar. And it, so I think it's a bittersweet moment for with many of our students, especially the first year students leaving campus to return to their permanent homes and others that are staying around and spending Thanksgiving on campus instead of going home as they normally would. And I know our focus this week is on staff, but I, I'd like to just say a few words to the students and their families. We're just wishing you the best and safe travels. I, this has been a hard year and it's been a really difficult semester emotionally, socially, academically. And we all look forward to a time when your experience as a Michigan student is closer to normal. Uh, speaking of Thanksgiving and the holidays, I again want to emphasize the need to stay vigilant. Uh, it, it can't be business as usual this year. In the past seven days, there have been more than a million new cases of COVID in the United States. Earlier this week, the CDC advised against holiday travel and gatherings outside of your immediate household. And unfortunately, these small household gatherings have been an important contributor to the current surge in COVID-19 and including on our campus, if you think about what a household unit on campus might look like. And families are trying to figure this out, including my own family. And a couple points I'll make, I think everyone knows this, but I, I just figured I'd make them is the more people, the more risk, especially when travel is added. And a negative test is not an absolute. It re represents a moment in time. And again, I wanna emphasize that you can't sort of test your way to safety. It's just one aspect. And eating and drinking are high risk activities. Now, pivoting back to the staff, I want to say thank you to everything you've been doing all year long, supporting the health system, the academic mission, research, athletics, museums, libraries, and everything in between. I did want to give a special shout out to everyone supporting students. Again, student life, housing, dining, DPSS, and academic advising. And that's a group that's been exceptionally busy this year. You know, all of you make M go. Uh, while we're squarely focused on COVID, I want to make sure we don't forget about health more broadly. I know we're going to hear about a lot of different programs from the other speakers, but I'd like to hire, uh, highlight a few resources offered by M Healthy. Um, quitting smoking or vaping is perhaps the single best thing you can do for your health. So take a look at M Healthy's tobacco consultation service. They have virtual quit kits to help you quit and stay quit. The national data suggests alcohol use, especially unalcohol use, has increased during the pandemic. 
And M Healthy's alcohol management program has virtual offerings to help you practice more mindful drinking and reduce alcohol consumption. And we'll have links to both of these in, in, um, available for you. And in January, there's a new intuitive eating program coming up called Nourish Your Whole Self. And this isn't a typical weight loss program, but instead helps participants really make peace with food and their bodies. Uh, the program is 10 weeks long and features self-paced webinars and weekly check-ins. So stay tuned. Finally, I'd like everyone to really think about making an appointment with their PCP, their primary care provider in 2021. Take a moment, schedule a health maintenance exam. Preventive care is a uh, key to good health moving forward. And remember that, um, you know, stay safe this weekend and uh, moving forward. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Milani. Uh, I next call upon Provost Collins. Thank you very much, President Schlissel. And uh, it's good to, to be with all of you again for our weekly Friday briefing. So for today's briefing that focuses on staff, I'll touch on three topics. Uh, one is decisions regarding staff working situations. Budget and wellness are the other two, but I really would like to start by recognizing just the critical role that staff play across our campus. Uh, in particular, my sincere appreciation for the many ways that um, staff have risen to the challenges that the pandemic has brought. In these really difficult circumstances, you make it possible to carry our mission forward. Uh, and this includes through providing critical support for our students, such as course scheduling, academic advising, as has been mentioned, maintaining classrooms and uh, study spaces and, and much, much more. It includes continuing the support for research that involves keeping labs safe, adjusting to all of the new protocols. And of course, it includes delivery of top quali quality medical care, which of course is ongoing. So I, I recognize that working remotely as many staff members are doing is really challenging. It's, it's, so, it's hard to balance work and family needs. We've talked about that a number of times on uh, these briefings and I know that continues. It often takes longer to get work done, for example, without the opportunity to have a hallway conversation to get questions answered in, in, in you know, quick, timely ways. And we also miss the social connections of work. So all of those things contribute to the challenges that uh, many of us and, and many of you are grappling with. So I'd like to really express my deep thank you for your dedication to the work that we do and the flexibility and the thoughtfulness that you continue to bring to it. So I'll turn next to talking about working contexts. It's clear that many people have questions about how decisions on where and how we work are being made. And we're guided by the public health information from the state of Michigan, Washtenaw County, as well as experts from across our campus. The health and safety of our community, staff, students, and faculty is really paramount and de-densifying campus is an important part of the strategy for containing the virus. The winter term plan will reduce density considerably and working remotely is part of, uh, of that plan. The development of effective vaccines as has just been mentioned is certainly an encouraging development but until there's widespread use, we'll continue to focus on working remotely. And the ability for staff to work remotely varies across campus, of course, because of context and the nature of the work. Um, and so we entrust the unit level leaders with making decisions about how and where work will be done because they have the most complete understanding of what's required to carry out their piece of the mission. The Workplace Innovation and Staff Experience Committee, WISE, has been charged with identifying new ways that we can work together after the pandemic and uh, Rich Holcomb will have more information about this to share in just a few moments. I'll shift next to the budget. As you may know, in addition to being chief academic officer, the provost is also the chief budget officer for the university. And in that capacity, I'd like to provide some just big picture information about the budget. So as we plan the budget, we focus on our ability to carry out our mission and on the continued employment of as many of our employees as possible. The university depends on the knowledge of, that employees bring to their work. So as we all know, there's quite a bit of uncertainty at the moment as a result of the pandemic and uh, all of the other uh, integrated consequences. And that impacts both our revenues and our costs. For in particular, tuition. Student enrollment was this fall in line actually with what we planned as we developed the budget. 
However, it's hard to estimate what enrollment will be like in the future, although of course we're working hard uh, to do that and to assemble all the information to help us. State appropriation is another key piece. The state funding did remain steady this year, but here too, we're quite uncertain about what will happen in the, co in the coming year. And the state does expect significantly decreased tax revenues. Responding to the pandemic has also increased our costs in myriad ways. And we hope that these are not overly long-term increases, but we do expect them to continue well into the coming year. So we're using a range of models as we develop the budget for fiscal year 21. In the spring, we implemented several measures to help control expenditures in the face of that budgetary uncertainty. And of course, we realize that those measures have impacted staff as well. And in considering them, we determined that they would contribute to our ability to continue employment for many. And that's one of the guiding principles as we tried to balance the, the different considerations. Last but not least, I'd like to just conclude by noting that all of us are stressed by the pandemic and, and the implications. It's important that we continue to be attentive to our own health and well being in that context. Um, so Denny and Kelsey are going to talk about resources that are available for all of us. And I, I truly encourage each of you to consider taking advantage of those resources. As one step to help, we did add the three season days to the calendar this year. And again, um, in starting with the, the uh, day next week on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And I hope that that's an opportunity to take a breath, to pause, uh, and to uh, take some time for yourself in, in this very stressful environment. So um, with that, I will send my best wishes for the week ahead to each of you in this challenging context. You've certainly all uh, earned it and um, I, you know, I wish you all the best. So with that, let me stop. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, next is Vice President of Student Life, Martino Harmon. Martino. Thank you, President Salisso, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and happy Friday. I'm going to cover three topics today. One is uh, sharing my appreciation of staff for all of their efforts. Two, I'll speak about uh, the support for staff and their well-being and collaborative efforts. And three, I'll address some of the concerns that staff may have. With Thanksgiving less than a week away, I want to take time to express appreciation for all of the Student Life staff as well as many campus partners who have contributed to the delivery of our core work through a challenging semester. When I came into this role in July, I learned the leadership mantra through this pandemic was and continues to be mission first, people always. And I'm grateful to be part of a phenomenal group of people committed to mission first and people always. Each year, the Division of Student Life delivers on our core work that goes beyond uh, the perhaps the most well-known services such as housing and dining to a wide range of support, advocacy, and learning opportunities for students. Some of you listening may not know, but that's why we have over two dozen units in student life. These staff teams deliver on health and well-being, community development and learning experiences, educational programming such as social justice, leadership, intercultural development and personal development and essential services such as housing and dining. Today, I wanna to recognize the entire Student Life team for their efforts to deliver on this work. I've been meeting with staff across the organization since the beginning of the semester, and I can affirm that there are successes to recognize from every single unit. Well, I can't uh, unveil the full highlight reel right now, but I do wanna recognize some unsung heroes. I wanna start by thanking the staff and facilities who have kept things safe and clean from day one. Without you, we could not have reopened our student life, student facing offices to safely welcome students who need walk-in appointments and who engage with our services. I wanna thank the University Health Service and all of the staff who are in frontline positions working in public health and crisis support for students and families who are navigating the uncertainties of the semester. Our always ready and on call Dean of Students staff, they have provided around the clock support for a wide range of support related to student emergency needs from financial concerns to mental health and emotional wellness. A special thank you 
to those student life team members from other units who keep delivering on roles and volunteer to be redeployed in other areas to help uh, the Dean of Students and UHS in their mission. In CAPS, our counselors and team members have worked tirelessly to support students and find creative workarounds to serve students in other states and countries while continuing on-campus support. The University Career Center has seen students who are very concerned by changes in employer approaches to recruiting and rapidly, they've rapidly developed a full portfolio of new tools and programs tailored to this unique challenging time. Meanwhile, peer support groups, events, and engagement opportunities sponsored by organizers and facilitators, such as the Program on Intergroup Relations, MESA, the Spectrum Center, Beyond the Diag, and Rec Sports have let students connect with others in a more deep way. Some of these events were convened on Zoom with students across the world and the country, of course, with others like field games and partner activities took place at places like Palmer Field. There are many other key staff who are working behind the scenes. Students and families might not get to meet you, but our other student facing units could not do what they do without you. From business and finance teams helping us to be strategic in resource planning while still delivering on our core work to the communications and marketing teams who help us to keep closely in touch with members of the community. All of the above is delivered in collaboration with all of you, the campus community. On behalf of the Student Life team, I wanna thank our student employees, our academic partners, our families and students who really share the commitment to make the University of Michigan a safe and great place. I wanna speak about staff well-being and support. I recognize that in student life, we spend a lot of time working with students on their wellness. But I'm thankful that our entire community while facing challenges, avoided tragedy by sticking together through this time period and taking the steps and precautions necessary to take care of themselves and keep others safe. As we head toward winter 2021, we will continue to be vigilant and thoughtful about how we can support our own well-being and the well-being of our students and the entire community. And finally, I wanna address staff concerns about the future. I wanna acknowledge that added to the list of concerns about health and well-being are community concerns about finances and employment. In particular, I know that many of you are concerned about balancing childcare and school needs in the coming months. We are factoring this in into our staff priorities and planning around work. We're carefully analyzing our needs and resources, and we're invested in stability for the long-term success of the university and the division so that we can continue to deliver on our mission of serving and supporting students. Part of what we're doing right now is analyzing our strategic approach to the pandemic, how it has gone so far, what worked well, and what hasn't worked so well, and what we can, can, can do to continue supporting our students given resource limitations. You may remember that in May, okay, I wasn't here, but the president issued a set of guidelines to help with resource stability. In student life, you've been resourceful, frugal, and careful to follow the tier one guidelines, which has helped us navigate a difficult landscape. I truly appreciate everything staff has done to deliver on our work in a creative way, in a shifting dynamic while being conscientious and, re and aware of resource management. So I wanna thank you. I wanna wish you a safe, enjoyable and relaxing Thanksgiving break and go blue. Thanks very much, Martino. You know, one group I'd like to add to the list of thank yous uh, are the folks who work in IT and the various units and ITS, our, our central services. You know, in a campus that's operating significantly remotely, uh, IT is uh, even more mission critical and its security is more mission critical than ever. Uh, and those folks have been working hard and many of them in effect are frontline workers who have to come in to deal with various hardware uh, type issues as well. So another special thank you to another group in addition to the entire academic portfolio and the student life world. And I'm sure Vice President Holcomb will talk about many others, so thank you. Uh, so next up is Associate uh, Vice President Rich Holcomb. Thank you, President Slissel. Um, I'm going to talk about four topic areas today. Uh, I'm going to share information about remote work, 
policies and programs, expense control measures, and engagement with staff. But I think it's first uh, most important to, to start off with expressing my gratitude to all the faculty and staff for the sacrifices and really the innovation and creativity and flexibility you've all demonstrated over the past eight months. Uh, I recognize these are extraordinarily difficult and challenging times for all of us. You may be working at home in a remote fashion, uh, trying to balance tutoring your children with online schoolwork, uh, a desire to feel more connected, uh, inclusion, and just the overall concern over well-being, very important issues. I want you to know that we continue to listen very carefully, we hear you, and we're committed to helping in any way we can. Um, we continue to really monitor the landscape and the situation very closely in, in addressing the issues that we're all facing, and we're committed to doing that. In a few moments, you all are going to hear from uh, Jenny McAlpine from our Work Life Resource and Children's Centers, and then Kelsey Stratton uh, from our Offices of Counseling and Workplace Resilience and Faculty and Staff Counseling and Consultation Office about some of the resources and some of the programs and tools that we've developed to help all of you. This week, we started on Monday with our annual service award, and it's the first time we've ever done a virtual service award. Uh, we were hoped to be in the big house this year to have our uh, service award for our, our employees with 30 years, 35, 40, 45, 50 years of service, and we even had one employee with 55 years of service. Incredible. Um, it was very inspiring to hear the stories of these individuals and their dedication and commitment to the university. And I think it's so important for us to just step back and reflect and to continue to recognize the accomplishments and the contributions of our great staff in the organization and our faculty for all that they're doing in these extraordinary times. So Starting off with remote work, I wanna talk about that for a moment. We know that this is, continues to be one of the biggest challenges for, for many individuals working remotely. Uh, we know that people are you know, having to utilize and experiment and learn new technology. One of the important things I think for everybody to be clear on is you know, how long will we continue to work remotely? Uh, as the president indicated in some prior messaging, uh, we, we should expect to work uh, remotely through at least the end of the winter semester. Uh, for those of us in non-academic units, that really means through the end of April, if not longer. Michigan Medicine has also released uh, similar guidance for their employees, and they're indicating through at least the end of March. So we know that we're going to continue to be working remotely for a period of time, and as the pandemic continues to surge, we're going to continue to uh, review and assess the, the time frames and we'll adapt accordingly. So it's important for all of us to uh, continue to do what we're doing, working remotely uh, in a safe fashion. And we also have some information on the, U of, uh, the HR website uh, about work re working remotely and other resources. And if you haven't had an opportunity, I'd encourage you to go to hr.umich.edu and click on the 2019 uh, coronavirus COVID-19 link that we have. There's a lot of uh, information and resources available for you there. Back in the spring when the, when the pandemic hit, we introduced some new policies and programs uh, to address the concerns and issues uh, that faculty and staff were, were facing, whether it would be to quarantine or isolate or to address childcare issues uh, or just simply uh, to support you working at home. We first introduced the 80 hour COVID uh, bank of time of, uh, for individuals uh, to help you all with managing time. In addition, the federal government through the CARES Act uh, implemented two other programs. Uh, they implemented the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which also uh, provided an additional 80 hours of time. And then there was the expanded FMLA uh, program that was also part of the Federal CARES Act. It's really important to, to, to know that we continue to pay very close attention to uh, the federal uh, scene in terms of what is happening in Washington with potentially new stimulus packages or with new uh, legislation around leave banks. Um, the COVID bank of time that the university have has no expiration date. 
the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the expanded FMLA are, are scheduled to expire at the end of this calendar year. So again, we're gonna pay close attention to those provisions. To date, we've had over 8,000 faculty and staff utilize uh, some portion of their COVID PTO bank. Uh, we've had almost 17,000 individuals utilize some of the emergency paid sick leave uh, time and over 1,500 individuals use expanded FMLA. So we know these are extremely important programs to help support all of you and we are committed to continuing to monitor this very closely. Uh, through this process, we've also looked very carefully at other things that we can do. Uh, we have modified benefit offerings. Uh, we now have telehealth visits. We've seen a significant number of uh, people taking advantage of the virtual visits that are offered through telehealth. Uh, we have made provisions and up adjustments to our retirement plan to allow for loans and withdrawals uh, provisions under the Federal CARES Act. And we've also adopted uh, new, new rules that the IRS has permitted around changing or canceling flexible spending accounts throughout the year. Um, as Provost Collins had indicated earlier, uh, we announced uh, a week and a half or so ago the addition of the three season days uh, for uh, all of campus. And we hope that you'll be able to take advantage of those additional days uh, to really, uh, you know, try to reflect and, and rest and recharge. Uh, and it's something that we think is really important, a way to acknowledge the outstanding work of our, of our university community. Um, Michigan Medicine also plans to reinstate its retirement match for its population effective as of January 1. Um, as Provost Collins indicated, you know, uh, around e expense measures, um, you know, we continue to be very um, conscious of those. One of the things that I think is, is critical is that everything we've been doing is in an effort to try to preserve jobs, and these steps help. When we look at uh, the salary and bonus freezes that are in place, they will, they will continue to, to, to be in place. Uh, same for non-essential travel and expenses. And again, our main focus and effort is how can we ensure uh, and work to help preserve jobs for our university community. In the coming up in, in the next few weeks, we plan to launch uh, a survey. Uh, one of the things that we know that has been extremely challenging uh, for staff is there's a, a variety of different issues. And we've been working uh, tirelessly to try to address the number of different issues staff are facing across the university community. We want to plan to uh, do a staff survey uh, to really help us understand what are some of the specific challenges and issues that you all are being faced with so we can get your input to help us better guide where we might direct our resources that would have the most value and, and assistance for all of you in this process. So be looking for a survey coming out in the next couple of weeks where we'll be seeking your input. And it will be very important if you have a few moments to take this survey uh, so we can hear your voice. It's extremely important. In addition, um, the Workplace uh, Innovation and Staff Experience Committee uh, has been meeting and working through and developing sets of recommendations. They've developed over 100 recommendations so far and are working through a process of refining and, and developing out specific items to share with leadership. In addition, we've also stood up another committee called the Future Workplace Work Group. I'm co-chairing that group along with Associate Vice President uh, for Finance, Brian Smith. And some of the things that we're working about in tandem with the WISE Committee is exploring issues around workplace flexibility, home office issues, technology, computer equipment, and many other areas. And we know that many people have been working at home uh, challenged with the variety of issues and questions around equipment and technology and some individuals not having access to all the right information or tools. And we're committed to working through and developing approaches and policies that will help ensure you know, equity for all, uh, but to help address the concerns that are being uh, raised by our university community. We're really fortunate. We have a great number of resources here at the university and our Work Life Resource Center uh, and through all of the various programs and services that we offer. Um, again, I encourage you to check out our website uh, with more, for more information. 
But in closing, you know, I think what's really important to, again, acknowledge, it, it, it's people. People are what make this great university work. Um, it, it, it's the individuals. I often say that we are in the, the people business, uh, serving people by people. And I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge that it, it, it's going to take continued flexibility. It's going to take continued innovation. Uh, it's going to take patience with one another uh, for us to continue to get through this process. This is a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us to continue to address the concerns. And I ask that we show kindness and we show support for one another and empathy. And through working together, I know that we will be able to accomplish great things. And I hope everybody really does have an upcoming, uh, great upcoming holiday season and has ability to, to rest and recharge. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Rich. Uh, next, uh, Jenny McAlpine, Director of Work-Life Programs. Hello, everybody. Thank you, President Schlissel, and thank you, Provost Collins, for having us here today. And thank you, too, for listening and considering how to help all the families out there that are struggling to care for their children. Um, this is a huge problem. It's not just us. It's throughout our state and our country and, th and indeed throughout the world that people are struggling right now to hold down their jobs, take care of their family, educate their children, take care of their elderly relatives as well, or disabled adults that they might have responsibility for. So it's a very complicated problem. And what I'd like to do today is to just give you a sense of the lay of the land uh, out there for our employees and talk about what we have in the works right now that we're considering to develop and then give you a, an overview of the services that are already established and out there for you. So first, just to put it in context, the University of Michigan has about 14,500 dependents listed in the benefits office um, for health benefits that are under the age of 18 years. So 14,500 children. And there are many more for students who are not employees and for others who work with us um, in various capacities that might not use our benefits. So there are many, many children out there that people are trying to take care of. Um, those children and their families are living all over the state of Michigan. There's a, a large number that live in Washtenaw and surrounding counties, but we also have our U of M Flint and U of M Dearborn campuses. So Wayne and Oakland County, Genesee County, all of the Thumb area. And we also have clinics for Michigan medicine all over the state. And uh, as Mr. Harmon was speaking, we have um, students and staff all over the world actually. So trying to help people in so many different situations is a big challenge. Here in Michigan, most of the schools are either closed or on a part-time schedule. Right now, none of the high school students are able to go to class, they're all home. Childcare in Michigan is still running. And to the credit of educators everywhere, the risks that teachers and early childhood educators are taking every day are significant, you know, and I send my thanks to all teachers and all educators everywhere for the work that they're doing. Um, so that's the situation that we're in right now. Childcare is running, but at um, a reduced level so that we can keep children safe in smaller groups. What we're working on right now, as Rich said, is a survey for campus to get a sense of where you are now and what would help you the most. Michigan Medicine did a survey back in the summer and they have some great data. Um, but as things change, we wanna get a sense of what people are looking at going into 2021. So be on the lookout for that survey and please respond so that we can hear what will help you most. We're also working on a new program that we hope to roll out early in 2021 called Family to Family, where any university family can post their interest in receiving help or providing help to another family so that we can support one another. And perhaps we can find ways to share childcare or to find ways for our um, children and our families and our elders to be able to have the social interactions that they need. So be on the lookout for that. Let me tell you a little bit about what we already have at the University of Michigan. The university has been very supportive of early childhood education and dependent care for many years. 
Right now we have five early childhood education centers, three here in Ann Arbor, one at U of M Dearborn and one at U of M Flint that together care for well over 800 children. Um, right now, four of those centers are open. The one that is not open is U of M Flint. They will be open again in May, but all four of the other centers are at reduced capacity. As I said, we're at about 65% capacity and the reason for that is to keep our group sizes very small so that we reduce risk. Those programs have put many, many other safety measures in place. And I applaud my early childhood educators for their work and their dedication and their patience and for continuing to make a wonderful place for children every day. And I also wanna thank the families that we're working with. They've been very supportive, very flexible, and very understanding with all of the uh, new policies and procedures that we have. We've been successful so far in that care. We've had a couple of scares, but all of our processes have been working. And so we're providing the safest environment that we can. We expect to continue to have those lower numbers until it's safer to expand to full enrollment. The other thing I wanna let you know is that out in the community, there are openings in childcare for children under the age of five. We have a partnership with community child care homes called the Campus Child Care Homes Network. And those 13 providers out in the community do have openings. There are other centers out there that also have openings. One of the difficulties for families right now is that they're nervous about putting their children in group care and for good reason. But if you are looking for group care, please contact our office, preferably by email at wlrc.umich.edu. And that um, address will also be in the uh, recording. So you'll be able to see that later. But contact us and we'll help you think about and brainstorm what would work for your family. We've focused a lot on in-home care in the last few months. And I wanna thank my Work Life Resource Center staff because they've worked very hard to expand these options. First, we have Kids Care at Home, and this is a program that you can register for. Our annual registration will be going up in a couple of weeks, but you can always register for it at any time. And this gives you 48 hours of subsidized child care for a caregiver who is trained and background checked to come to your home. And you can use those 48 hours in four hour blocks any way that you wish. So if you have a morning or afternoon a week that you need help for, it can help to bridge you for a while if you need some time. That is available as well as a program called Family Helpers. Now this is different from the family to family program that I mentioned. Family Helpers has been out there for quite a while and it's a listing of university students and retirees who would be available for in-home care, not just for children, but for others in your family that might need someone to be with them or take them to an appointment or to help you with any kind of household chores. We have about a hundred people listed right now I know the students have gone home, but many of those students live in Michigan and they live in communities that might be just right for you. You can post an advertisement on Family Helpers and it will go out by text to everybody who's on the list to see if they can respond and help you out in that way. And finally, I would say that on our website, we have listings of other supports for childcare, nanny services, tutoring services, services that do provide more options for in-home care. It's our sincere wish that one of these will work for your family and that something will come together to help you make it through the next few months. I'm thankful for all of you out there. The University of Michigan is a wonderful place to work. People have been very supportive of each other. I wish you all a wonderful break next week and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, next is Kelsey Stratton, Program Manager for Resiliency and Wellbeing Services. Kelsey. Hello, and thank you, President Schlissel, Provost Collins, and our leaders across U of M and Michigan Medicine for highlighting the emotional needs and resources within our community. First, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible stress, uncertainty, and worry that so many are feeling right now. More than anything, perhaps, is the feeling of exhaustion. These feelings are normal and expected given these challenging times. And so my hope today is to provide some resources to just ease the weight of this stress, even if just a bit. Each one of us would benefit from having more supports in our lives. 
There are two primary offices that serve the mental health needs of faculty and staff. The Faculty and Staff Counseling and Consultation Office, or FASCO, serves Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn campus. The Office of Counseling and Workplace Resilience serves our Michigan Medicine faculty and staff. Both of these offices are deeply committed to supporting the mental health needs of our university and healthcare uh, communities. They serve all faculty, staff, retirees, and benefits eligible dep adult dependents. The services are compassionate, completely confidential, and offered at no cost to you. Both offices provide individual and couples counseling, as well as crisis support, group offerings, education, and consultation with supervisors on mental health topics. These offices also serve as an information and referral resource. You can contact us with any questions at all about mental health. We want to make it easy for you to find the help that you need and deserve. We recognize the impact that the pandemic has had on healthcare professionals, and I want to mention a specific resource from Michigan Medicine. The Office of Counseling and Workplace Resilience coordinates the COVID-19 stress resource team, and that's a multidisciplinary team of mental health professionals who can provide in-person and remote crisis support to healthcare teams and individuals. To contact FASCO, please call 734-936-8660 or email fasco at umich.edu. To contact the Office of Counseling and Workplace Resilience, you can call 734-763-5409 or email counseling at med.umich.edu. You can also use that contact information to access the COVID-19 stress resource team. In addition to these offices, I will just share some of the many resources available and links to these websites will be posted with the town hall recording. So first, our Department of Psychiatry has extensive expertise in many of the issues affecting faculty, staff, and their families during the pandemic. The department created a toolkit called the Michigan Psychiatry Resources for COVID-19. The website has a wealth of information on specific mental health conditions, as well as resources for kids, adults, specific communities, and tools for healthcare providers. I'll also highlight a helpful recorded webinar from the Department of Psychiatry. It's called Hope, Coping and Hoping, Mental Health Tips for Trying Times, hosted by Department of Psychiatry Chair, Dr. Gregory Dalek, and featuring several faculty experts who are answering questions provided uh, by the public. The Michigan Medicine Depression Center has an online toolkit that includes mental health screening tools, education, and resources for anyone seeking help for themselves or for others. The Depression Center also launched a new webcast called The Mental Minute. This show discusses a variety of mental health topics and features expert interviews from within and outside the U of M community. The Michigan Medicine Wellness Office uh, has a website, the comprehensive source for emotional health and well being topics, and the site coordinates with the many partners providing emotional health services. And then finally, as was mentioned earlier, the M Healthy programs offer a wide variety of resources for all aspects of well being. I'd like to remind you how, about how you may access mental health services through your health benefits as well. There are many options for mental health treatment and many mental health providers are offering telehealth and telehealth is covered under the health plans. Finally, I want to acknowledge that we are nearing the end of the year. And this is a time when many of you will be celebrating holidays or just naturally reflecting on the past 12 months. This holiday season will look and feel different. Many of you have experienced immense losses this year. There will be grief. Many of you have experienced frustration, anger, anxiety, worry, and many of you may be looking forward to 2021 with some sense of hope. And so a period of rest allows us to reflect and prioritize, to give care and attention to our essential needs. Make it a priority to care for yourself by finding opportunities to slow down, to check in with yourself and those around you. There is no easy one size fits all solution for getting through a crisis, but a few things can help in a moment of difficulty. Find moments of rest, even if that means just a few seconds to pause in the midst of the busyness of life. Relaxation, mindful breathing techniques can help lessen the intensity of strong emotions. Remember the power of sticking to the basics, sleep, exercise, diet, and take good care of yourself through healthy daily routines. Routines can also provide a much needed sense of predictability during uncertain times. Be gentle with yourself and with others. 
Mindfulness practices can help us stay focused on the present moment and let go of worries. During winter holidays, expectations about what should or should not happen can sometimes result in anxiety or frustration or disappointment. This season, practice letting go of expectations and try to focus on savoring and appreciating the moment just as it is. Ask for and accept help when needed. Seek additional support and comfort from your family, your friends, colleagues, and mental health professionals. Know that each and every person has resilience and that sources of strength are within you as well as around you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Kelsey. Uh, I turn things over once again to Dr. Milani uh, to uh, offer some final comments and then moderate questions. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Rich, Jenny, for your leadership during this extraordinary year. And Kelsey, boy, I just, I always feel better after I, I hear you. Uh, you know, those of you who don't know, you know, we were really fortunate to recruit her. She's like our five-star recruit. And we were able to bring her here, um, get her away from uh, South Africa, actually, where she supported uh, people in the Peace Corps, healthcare providers in the Peace Corps. And uh, so virtual care is something that she's been doing for a long time. And, and I, you know, I will hope all of us will take your advice to heart. We do have some questions and although we're focused on staff, there are some really good questions regarding the students. So I'm gonna uh, direct these toward uh, uh, Martino. Uh, this is a, a good question that's been asked a lot, and I think this is a good one to discuss. Does the fact that many students who are living in dorms this semester may now simply look off campus housing for how off campus housing opportunities worry you? And what measures will be in place to account for greater numbers of students who live off campus? Thank you, Dr. Milani. So certainly we encourage students to remain at their permanent residence, but we also know that some students and families made the choice to have students stay in the Ann Arbor area. Um, so we are aware of that and we are offering the same level of support, whether it be through virtual or in-person in safe programming to all students, no matter where they are. And I'll mention a few initiatives and offices that are really focused on, on helping and support the, uh, helping to support those students. One is our Thriving in the First Year um, program, which is our FYE first year experience program. And we have a whole task force that is really built about uh, built around redesigning our efforts in that area for first year students. The Center for Campus Involvement has a number of programs and connections to student organizations so that students can build community and can get involved and, and uh, you know, make connections. And the Beyond the Diag program through the Dean of Students Office uh, really helps students who live off campus uh, to, um, to get supported in a variety of different ways. So those are three uh, specific programs or departments, but every department within Student Life, we will certainly uh, support students no matter where they are. And we'll certainly be aware of students that have recently made the choice to, to live off campus. Thanks, Martino. And I, you know, I'll just add as a, as a parent, it is an adjustment for your, for your students to move from the residence hall where a lot of things are done for them to, to being off campus. and. And again, we needed to de-densify the halls and uh, we know that some, some have chosen to move into apartments. And you know, I think just um, thinking through some of the things like where you're gonna get food and groceries and support and having plans for that because they're, they're like a million little things that you might not have thought about. And, and again, I think our students are gonna, they're gonna make good decisions and hopefully they'll have a, a good semester whether they're at home or they're in a, off campus or, uh, and, th and there are uh, several that are returning to the residence halls. Uh, there is a question about uh, the saliva surveillance testing. And you know, I know this has been something in general that there's some confusion. And I'm gonna ask uh, President Schlissel to just comment on the status and what's happening with it and what's, what's testing gonna look like once we finish departure testing. Sure, so the uh, saliva surveillance program will continue. Uh, in the short term, I urge everyone to sign up for this community sampling and tracking program. Uh, that's the best way to get access. There'll be plenty of access available at least once a week for testing in the weeks ahead uh, as part of this surveillance program. Uh, but as you know, our, as our capacity grows, uh, we're going to um, take more advantage of testing and make it required for certain uh, populations. So when the new semester begins, uh, all students, undergrads returning to live in our dorms will have to take pre-arrival tests and also require testing uh, once a week. 
uh, all uh, students coming to campus to take an in-person class or to work in a research lab or to work at a job or to use any campus facility will also be uh, required to take a COVID test uh, once a week. And then we'll make once a week testing available for all faculty and staff that come to campus uh, as part of their work uh, in the new semester as we ramp up our capacity. Uh, Michigan Medicine is working on its own uh, testing program and there'll be a testing site set up uh, with more convenience uh, to the health system as well. Uh, so it'll be a combination of required testing for uh, subpopulations in our community where the rates of COVID-19 are high and then testing availability for uh, most everyone else who comes to work on campus every day. Yeah, thank you. And so testing is one of those places where it continues to change and evolve and capacity is growing as you heard. And you know, I just wanted to comment on the earlier question. I, I have heard from some families or at least some faculty who said, well, are the students moving off campus so they don't have to be tested? And I just, I just wanna clarify if you are on campus, whether in class or in the facilities, you're in the library, you're at the rec facilities, uh, that testing will be required, whether you happen to live in the residence hall or you're living uh, on your own somewhere. So it's not, a, it's not a workaround, but again, a lot of people are not gonna physically be in classrooms because of the way next semester is designed. Uh, Martino, I wanna ask you this question too. This is um, something that came up before and also in the Q&A. Uh, what, what will you do for students that live in the dorms who test positive before they leave? And, and of course this has come up. Yeah, so, uh, and Dr. Milani, feel, feel free to fill in any gaps, but we will certainly have our quarantine and isolation housing still available um, for students that need to, um, to quarantine or isolate before they travel home. And there are a number of uh, safety precautions and travel guidance around um, traveling and self-isolating once students arrive at their permanent location. So. Uh, we will continue to, to work and have that service available for students that need that. And that's a partnership between housing and university health service um, and, uh, and other uh, public health professionals on campus. Yeah, I will just add that thankfully the numbers have come down in quarantine isolation housing, but there's no plan to scale that back or that taking a break from the holidays. The students who are there will be taken care of uh, the way they normally would. And in fact, um, not that anyone wants to be there, but um, housing and dining have actually tried to take extra care, um, have a special catering menu for the holidays for people who, who end up um, having to be there. And, and again, the idea was to, to try to modify your behavior ahead of departure to make sure that you didn't test positive on your way out, but um, that, that may come up. Uh, this one, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna present to President Schlissel. Can you provide guidance to graduate students who are traveling for the holiday and then returning to work in labs, in research labs. Yeah, you know, I think it's very challenging uh, coming and going from the campus. Uh, I think uh, everyone uh, who is leaving has to be cognizant of the health of the, place, of the people where they're going. And that's why I encourage everyone to get these uh, departure uh, testing when they're heading home for the holidays. Um, uh, so sign up uh, to participate through the uh, still ongoing saliva testing program, this community sampling program. We're working to provide as much capacity as possible to be able to test people uh, when they come back to town uh, after uh, the holidays. But you have to watch your exposures, you know, keep your masks on, uh, try not to have large gatherings, you know, all the things that you've done to keep yourself uh, healthy and safe uh, in town, you have to continue uh, if you're going uh, home for the weekend and then coming back to work in the labs. Uh, university public health policy doesn't require testing or quarantine following the holiday uh, unless other conditions are met. Certainly if you have any symptoms, do not go to work, get yourself tested right away. Um, and uh, you know we strongly encourage uh, that um, uh, the research community continue to follow the same best practices uh, that has kept that community uh, quite safe and healthy throughout the pandemic. Wear your mask, maintain low densities in the labs, uh, try not to be within six feet of one another for significant lengths of time. Uh, and uh, you know, check, do your daily symptom checks. Uh, um, again, this uh, surveillance testing and through these combination of things will lower uh, risk, but you know, also uh, you have a good holiday 
and uh, have a, a smart and safe holiday as well, and then come back recharged and uh, ready to get back to work again. Thank you. There, there's sort of a related question, which I, I can comment on and see if anyone has any um, additional. What, uh, what should staff do if they see someone in their on-campus building who's clearly sick, runny nose, coughing, sneezing? Uh, you know, hopefully that's not happening. And again, I think we've really emphasized throughout this time that you, you shouldn't be coming to work sick. And I think at the health system is probably the place of where we feel the most pressure to come to work. This has been a, a culture shift. Uh, this is the uh, supervisors have gotten training in this area. And, you know, again, I think gently reminding people that they shouldn't be here with symptoms. Um, occupational health is um, the point of calling because you, we certainly would like to see people get tested uh, quickly and efficiently in that situation since it has implications. And Oc health, um, they, occupational health has been extremely busy in, um, in recent weeks, but but that is the, the entry point. I don't know, Rich, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, we have uh, certainly uh, indicated and expressed that if, if you're not feeling well, it's okay to not come in. In fact, you should not be coming in to work. Uh, and, and managers, uh, again, need to understand that and, and have that flexibility. And so we encourage people, if you're not feeling well, uh, to stay home. Uh, there's a multitude of resources. Of course, you can contact occupational health services. You also can con contact your primary care physician. Um, and so it's just important that we give people the, 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 the space and the time that if you're not feeling well, you should not be arriving at work and, and potentially exposing others. So I think that's critically important. Yeah, this has been a, a big culture shift and it's been a culture shift in the classroom too. And, and I think this is hopefully one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Like if we're sick, we shouldn't really be around others. And I know we're approaching the end of our time. I'm gonna turn it back over to President Schlissel to um, end things for us. Good, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malati. And thanks to uh, all of the participants today, especially uh, our visitors, uh, Kelsey, Jenny, uh, and Rich. So thank you very much. Um, uh, please, everybody who's listening in, uh, have a safe and healthy a happy and hopefully restful uh, Thanksgiving break. It's much needed uh, and you know, greatly anticipated. Uh, a thank you also to the Fleming IT staff who's been staffing this meeting uh, and actually allowing thousands of people to participate uh, and keeping the technology up and running for us. So uh, a healthy and happy holiday break to them as well. To all our students who are getting a week off, Boy, finally, you know, to take advantage of that week. I'm sure it'll be quite welcome and the end of the semester is near. And to our faculty and staff, thank you again very much for your ongoing efforts under incredibly challenging circumstances. Uh, we would have uh, no chance of fulfilling our mission without your level of commitment. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good uh, remainder of the day. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you after the holiday. Thanks, bye-bye.